our AMSIS panel for our poster presentation on Ready or Not, Here They Come, the application of naval knowledge, skills, and abilities for future conflicts and novel threats. I'm Rear Admiral Darren Vai. I am the commander of Naval Medical Forces Atlantic, and I'm going to ask our distinguished panel who uh, has appropriately distanced themselves in this uh, unique time of COVID to introduce them uh, as we go down, starting with Captain Schofer. Good afternoon, Admiral. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Captain Joel Schofer. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Medical Corps, and I'm an emergency physician by training. Good afternoon, Admiral. Uh, Master Chief Mike Fossen. I'm the Deputy Director of the Hospital Corps, and I'm a Deep Sea Diving Independent Duty Corpsman. Good afternoon, Admiral. I am Captain Rich Lawrence. I am the uh, Nurse uh, Corps Office uh, Policy and Practice. Uh, Assistant W Director, and I am a, a periop uh, nurse as well. Good afternoon, Admiral. I'm Commander Jennifer Wallinger, and I am the Director of the Medical Service Corps Policy and Practice Officer, and I'm a dietitian by training. As you know, Navy Medicine's mission from our Surgeon General is to provide well-trained medical experts operating as high-performance teams to project medical power in support of naval superiority. As a response to that, we have uh, been working uh, with the Navy Knowledge, Skills, and Abilities Project Management Office aligned to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs uh, requirements for establishing KSAs and with the Joint KSA Program Management Office to establish those knowledge, skills, and abilities that are required for our sailors supporting the Navy and the Marine Corps or in the joint environment um, to be prepared both in currency and competency to support their practice as an expeditionary scope of practice in the operational environment. So as we have built the Navy model in alignment with HA requirements and with what the Joint Program Office do, I'd like to open this to each of you to respond how do you see the KSAs fitting into the Navy Sur Surgeon General's priorities of people, platforms, performance, and power? Captain Schofer again, it seems, it seems to me that when it comes to the Surgeon General's four Ps, uh, the KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities is our way to make sure that down the line, the people that we deploy uh, on various platforms can perform, you know, to use the exact first three Ps. It seemed like in the past, what seemed what we what we did was we just assumed, hey, if you were trained to do your job, uh, you were ready to go, and the KSAs are going to be a way to be much more active about monitoring whether somebody's truly ready to go perform in an expeditionary setting. I agree with Captain Show for this is Master Chief Fossen. Uh, I think it, uh, it it realigns and and helps with sustainment uh, for the medical core hospital corps, medical service corps, and nurse corps. The combat casualty care team has kind of a complex method of calculating currency and translating complex case care to combat casualty care. I know the Corman methodology may not be as complex. Can you speak a little bit on how that is in alignment with the Surgeon General's four Ps and how it may differ for the hospital core compared to say a general surgeon expected to operate in the expeditionary scope of practice uh, with trauma capabilities? Yes, sir. Uh, so with the hospital corpsman right now, we're, we're developing right now with uh, JTS and the other services uh, of exactly what our four different lines of uh, TCCC will be. And uh, that's, differently set because level three and level four are the ones we're working on right now and they're the ones that are not complete. So, uh, so, so of course, level four's provider, uh, which the IDCs and uh, search and rescue medical technicians will be able to do the same things uh, such as the other, the other uh, providers. But uh, as for the other, the last one being the rest of the will be level three, uh, still, um, still working on those exactly what they're going to do, uh, how they're going to take that information from the the joint trauma system and from the uh, OT tri -C. Thank you, sir. So I think part of this, um, part of these efforts in, in, in creating these KSAs helps 
identify a number of different levels what's needed. So the the, the specialist, um, whether regardless of what core and, and, and what subspecialty they might have, um, to the command leadership and, and the various stages along the way, it gives them a, a, a mechanism so that they all have an understanding of what's needed, what you know, what's still out there, what they need to complete, and it gives them something to, uh, basically a tool to go by and help guide some of those practices and training and then communicating that to DHA. So if we're at the MTFs, <clears throat> we have that option and, and ability, I should say, to communicate that to DHA of this is time I need to have spent away in order to accomplish some of these tasks. I like that thought. We're going to come back in a, in a later question when you're saying time away, because one of the questions we'll ask a little bit later is how do we leverage the direct care system and some other mechanisms? But I want to save that. Um, Captain Wallach, how about your thoughts on that first question? For the KSAs, uh, just getting right down to people at the individual level, it really helps the individual member know what it means to be ready and to help drive that conversation um, and uh, drive their readiness skills. So working closely as I do with the specialty leaders, you know, what are those KSAs um, and how can we have that as a two-way street with the specialty as well as the service members? I appreciate those thoughts. One of the complaints I've heard, and I may come back to Captain Schofer because uh, Joel, you mentioned something when it came to the statement kind of, of, you know, we used to think just because you were an emergency medicine doctor, or just because you're a periop nurse, you know how to operate in the uh, expeditionary environment. And the saying that I get a lot is, you know, well, I don't know how the KSAs were developed. I don't know who put them together. Um, your topic's very apropos. It actually reminds me of a comment to General Dunford, who used to always say, you know, if you recognize that what you're doing is not the best, then for those that are against it, you can't be against something without being for something. And I think you kind of hinted to the fact that the KSAs are a defined mechanism to understand better what it is to practice in that expeditionary scope of practice. But can you help for everyone else out there understand both at the joint level and then within Navy, who, who develops the KSAs? I mean, is this BUMED? that is sitting at the higher headquarters and saying, I know what you need. What communities brought together to help develop the KSAs? Yeah, Admiral, I, um, I had the pleasure of serving as the special leader for emergency medicine when we started developing the KSAs. So I was actually directly involved and uh, as they say, in the room where it happened uh, when, when we did the development. And essentially what, what we did was we brought together a joint group, uh, Army, Air Force and Navy, and the first thing we did was we we made sure that everybody in the room had recently deployed in, ex, in an expeditionary setting and took a look, look at data for every specialty to say, OK, when people deploy, uh, what do you actually wind up doing? What procedures do you do? What, what cases do you do? What kind of patients are you encountering? And then uh, the second step, as I remember it, was we took that expeditionary scope of practice that we had defined and we looked at the things where that were being done in MPS. And again, we took a group of people who had, uh, from all the services who had deployed, and, and they looked at the procedures that were done uh, and in the garrison setting and tried to essentially map what was being done there to the expeditionary scope of practice so that when someone was in garrison and, and generating RVUs and doing procedures, uh, the uh, if, if you took care of a septic patient uh, in the emergency department or the ICU, um, it, that might not be a trauma patient, but a lot of what you're doing with that patient involving resuscitation overlaps with uh, the more traditional expeditionary idea of trauma resuscitation. So those folks would uh, pick out uh, exactly uh, what overlaps and uh, Essentially, uh, with the help of some contractors, we came up with uh, essentially what's a scoring system. So that if you took care of a septic patient, you would get certain points and credit toward meeting your expeditionary KSAs because there's a lot of overlap there. So really, who, who developed it? It was it was a, a group of joint people from the specialty that had recent expeditionary experience. So I think that to me that that lends a lot of credibility to the to the KSAs as they were developed. 
No, I appreciate those those thoughts and that insight. Uh, it also sounds to me like you said with transference of skills that you know pathophysiology is pathophysiology, and while there needs to be an understanding of the mechanism of injury, which may be assessed through some knowledge or skills assessment tests that the overall transferability from complex care, whether it be, you know, a, a surgeon working on a tumor in a liver or whether it be a surgeon taking out a piece of shrapnel from a liver, there is obviously some transferability of skills that occurs there. I'd like to ask anyone else on the panel if they kind of have a thought or an idea from their communities of how the KSAs uh, operating from an NTF environment are able to be transferred or or things that are being done to really ensure that we can function in that expeditionary scope of practice. Yes, sir. So uh, for the hospital core, it's, uh, it's slow, very much different. Uh, a lot of the things that we do in, in our service is uh, very service specific, such as uh, we have reconnaissance IDCs, deep sea diving technicians, um, and uh, to get that information, we, we really have to use our enlisted technical leaders, much like the, the, the uh, specialty leaders, other than just in a different uh, arena. Uh, and, but we do have, we also use the, the joint KSAs, just as uh, Captain Schofer also mentioned, uh, just slightly different, but uh, it also, it just gets into uh, the weeds of, uh, you have a basic corpsman that does their KSAs and then they build off of that. So help me understand that dashboard a little bit. Is that just globally across the Navy or can I look at it, you know, by NMRTC or we deploy as platforms, it's one of the uh, Surgeon General's four Ps or even the individual level, um, you know, leaders, as you say, need knowledge to see where we have gaps in this case within the KSAs, how's that dashboard helping leaders do that and, and how is it developed? Can you help me understand that a little bit? Yes, sir. The dashboard um, has the standardized metrics and it is at the individual level, but it's also at the NMRTC and we can see it Navy wide so we can really understand uh, where our readiness is generated and where we have gaps. So as a commander of Naval Medical Forces Atlantic, if I go to this site, I can see, I probably don't want to know whether Captain Schofer has his emergency medicine KSAs because I'd expect my NMRTC commander to do that. But if I understand you correctly, I can hold my NMRTC commanders accountable or I can hold my platform COs accountable for ensuring that they are doing everything within the system to maintain their KSAs. Is, is that what you're telling me this new uh, dashboard will do? Yes, sir. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, one of the ironies is, is that right now we don't have a mechanism to capture um, really that clinical currency from those experiences. Do you have any thoughts on that? Should we be capturing it? Um, how could we capture it? And, uh, you know, how do we ensure the system stays appropriate in providing the opportunities for KSAs without forcing physicians to go out and moonlight, but by the same token, physician is moonlighting, giving them credit. How do you see all that and how should we be moving forward when it comes to non-MTF uh, currency practices? Well, let me finish counting my money before I answer that question. Um, I do think that, I will tell you, Admiral, from the beginning, that was a huge question. And, and in the beginning, we were told assume moonlighting will not count and can't count. And I think that the discussion about that has, has changed as time goes on. I think we, we should build a system where people don't have to moonlight to meet their readiness criteria. But if they do moonlight, I think we need to count it. I mean, I think if, you know, if you take me, if you, if you say, hey, I moonlight one weekend a month, in, in a level one trauma center and I do a bunch of procedures, it, it would it would be dishonest and, and really pretty inefficient to not count that because then the commander wherever I am would say, oh, we are not doing enough procedures. We need to we need to spend time to, to get to these procedures, even though I know I, I did a bunch of them the weekend before. It just didn't count. So I think we need to come up with a system where moonlighting, if done, counts. And uh, 
it's a challenge to capture that data. I, I personally think that it, it, once we have a fully fleshed out uh, product that involves the KSA dashboard, that there's going to have to be a module where um, members can essentially self-input procedures and things that go toward meeting their KSAs. And no, uh, a comment and then a, a follow-on question. I, I liked your statement of the system should not be forcing someone to moonlight to maintain readiness, but the system should not be penalizing those who obtain readiness through moonlighting. I, I like that statement and hopefully, if not already codified in uh, doctrine, could be. Um, you know, we have been supporting across DOD, but also within Navy medicine, you know, the whole of government approach to support the novel coronavirus. Um, we've deployed people across the country. We've deployed, you know, the two hospital ships. We've deployed personnel and EMFs, and we've even put together some uh, packages with uh, rural remote uh, readiness teams and acute care teams. Um, you know, as we look to capture lessons learned um, from those experiences and leverage them into the future, my question to you is this, and uh, we can start again with uh, Captain Wallen since I just finished with uh, Captain Schofer, but, you know, how's Navy medicine support to the federal government to this novel coronavirus impacted how we plan for our future mission sets and how do you tie those individual knowledge, skills, and abilities from those missions back into a platform's, you know, mission essential tasks or their rock PO? How do we tie all those three things together with what we've learned from our COVID response? Yes, sir. I had the opportunity of being mobilized um, with EMF Mike um, when we deployed uh, 400 personnel from uh, from the hospital. And I know that we've done a much better job of capturing those lessons learned, um, first of all. And um, we realized quickly that an EMF of 400 was not the appropriate uh, platform for the mission uh, and discovered and had to quickly uh, adjust and develop into smaller teams where we broke out into the different um, areas that we were needed and ended up in five locations. So a lot of lessons learned from that. And I know that moving forward, um, designing these more rapid platforms is um, definitely necessary. How will we uh, tie these all together? Um, one is the lessons learned uh, portal uh, that has been developed. Again, that definitely helps us to capture these better because I think in the past we have not. We've learned a lot, but moving forward, we really have a good handle on that. Many of you are aware a couple of years ago, we had the uh, requirements evaluation team. It was a rapid JSIDS process through OPNAV that looked at future naval uh, capabilities uh, for distributed maritime operations um capabilities such as the roll to light maneuver the erss as you commonly know the establishment of in route care systems as those come into the fleet being palmed uh starting really the erss is there now um deploying on an epf we should have in 22 23 the ercs is in palm 22 you know as we adapt to those requirements you know how does navy medicine need to adapt our use of the KSAs to support those new platforms as they come online. And uh, Mass Chief, I don't think you got a chance to answer the first one. So from the uh, Corman community, you know, and you can pick uh, any of the, uh, you know, any C's that would be aligned to uh, any of these new platforms because there are obviously multiple ones, but. How do you see the KSAs having to adapt to these new platforms and, and what recommendations would you give to senior leadership and the Surgeon General to help you accomplish that? Yes, sir. So uh, I would think that pre-deployment training cycles would be very key uh, to have uh, whatever NEC that would be if it was a surgical technician, because now we're talking about if we're going to be on a roll to light maneuver situation, they're going to have to do um, very different things than they would do at a uh, NMRTC or NMRTU. 
So if we would have a cycle uh, using those KSAs, it, it would add them uh, to the best category for deployment. 